Hello, I'm Larry Wilson, and I would like to welcome you to tape number 13 in this 209 series, Shadows of God. Actually, uh, today's tape will be number 7 in our series on Isaiah, and we're going to pick up in Isaiah chapter 33. The study of Isaiah is a very interesting study because God reveals, perhaps, uh, in the book of Isaiah, his great love for his children in some of the most dramatic ways. In the studio with me today is David Brooks. Welcome, David. Glad to be here. I'm sorry that um, you weren't with me on the last tape, but we're always glad when you can be in the studio and we can... Uh, work our way through these Old Testament prophets. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm glad that I can be here when I can. <laughs> We're going to uh, pick up um, in, in chapter 33 and starting with verse 1. Woe to you, O destroyer, you who have not been destroyed. Woe to you, O traitor, you who have not been betrayed. When you stop destroying, you will be destroyed. When you stop betraying, you will be betrayed. Sounds like somebody's talking in, in riddles here, doesn't it? The idea comes from the concept that Israel did not have an understanding of the devil that we have today. Israel understood about the destroyer, the adversary of man. They knew something about the actions of Lucifer uh, in Isaiah chapter 14. You know, we read about how Lucifer was cast down and the language in Isaiah seems to operate from time to time on two levels at the same time. There's the present tense application with respect to time, and then there's the uh, application where the at some point in the time, God is going to deal with the larger uh, party. For example, you, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. Uh -huh. Now, on the present tense level, you, you know, they could, they could use this taunt uh, against Nebuchadnezzar, but in its ultimate usage and in its larger picture, it's the real king of Babylon. And when you get to the details that he was cast out of heaven and that he was actually Lucifer the angel, the, one of the anointed cherubs, you began to see an interesting development. Nebuchadnezzar's behavior and Lucifer's behavior look almost like one and the same thing. And this is what the Bible is trying to, to show. Uh, in today's study, we're going to ultimately get to Hezekiah. And uh, Hezekiah, as long as his heart was humble, he was a good man. And he did good things uh, for the Lord. But then Hezekiah became vain and puffed up. I mean, after all, he was the king, you know, in Jerusalem. And um, as far as he was concerned, that was the world, you know. But... When, when he got vain and puffed up, God dealt with him. And how easy it is for man to really forget his mortality and his frailty. Well, there's an interesting dualism or parallelism here, as well as when Jesus was telling his disciples, you have seen me, mm -hmm. you have also seen the Father. That's right. Because... Whatever is going on in Satan's mind is going on in the carnal mind. 
And whatever's going on in God's mind is the same thing that's going on in the spiritual mind. So there's a, there's this parallelism. I guess that's yes, a good that's word well for said. It, uh-huh. uh, with it, and and the mind can take you to either side. It just depends on what you want to do. That's the beauty of poetry. Poetry gives you a literary device to say more and to exaggerate and to put different emphasis in areas that need... It's like, if you will, the political cartoons. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of art and the same use of exaggeration or personification or, or parable or hyperbole that allows things to be said in different ways. And it's all, the whole point is to make a point. Yes. There, there's, a, yes. there's something that needs to be said in a way that you can't miss it. That's right. That's right. I wanted to um, point out here in verse 1 what we've just read. Um, Israel is going to be destroyed. Uh, God has already predicted that the Babylonians are going to come and uh, bring judgment. God has already predicted that the Assyrians are going to come and bring judgment upon the northern kingdoms. And Babylon is going to come and bring judgment on the southern kingdoms. So the poetry here, Woe to you, O destroyer. You who have not been destroyed, woe to you, O traitor, you have, who have not been betrayed. Because when you stop destroying, you will be destroyed. And when you stop betraying, you will be betrayed. The idea is, is that God grants to all kingdoms a period of prowess, a period of um, importance, but that passes. That passes. Everything ebbs and flows. Um, God is uh, speaking uh, down in verse 14. God is uh, speaking through Isaiah, and God is trying to show that no matter how corrupt the system, no matter how corrupt the government, no matter how, how evil things become, it is imperative that God's people hold to a standard of right doing that is acceptable in his sight? This is a tough question. I had a friend who was a missionary that went to um, Ghana over in West Africa. And um, when he first got there, um, this man who was probably one of the finest and most honest and upright Christians you've ever met, he was amazed at how much graft and corruption went on just in the usual process of conducting business. You didn't just uh, buy a case of flour or a, a barrel of flour. There were, there, there were, if the price was one thing, there was always money flowing under the table to get that price. And uh, if you were trying to bring something in in customs, there were always people that had their hand out to approve what was legitimately, uh, you know, a custom entry. Yeah, it was already done. It, it, it should have moved on. I, I, I had that same thing happen on a uh, shipment of farm equipment that uh, I helped arrange to get down to uh, Honduras. And uh, rather than pay all of the um, necessary palms in order to get the stuff moved expeditiously, uh, the company I was working for let that equipment sit for one year uh, on the dock, waiting for that one year to pass so that it could get through legitimately without anybody with their hand on it. Uh, because the, the, the amount of money that was being asked was more than the value of the equipment. And we sent over thirty thousand dollars worth of worth of farm equipment down there. It was it was remarkable. Things like this infuriate God. 
because they are so counterproductive to the social structure. And when the, the government and its uh, agencies become so corrupt, then the whole economy and the whole government itself begins to languish. Well, it begins to show you what is really important to the people running the government. Yes. They're, they're only interested in whatever they can get out of the situation. Right. They're not cared about, they don't care about the people. We sent <clears throat> 2,000 pounds of a food product to Mexico City. And uh, that product made it as far as Laredo, Texas, and it got stopped at the border. At the border, we were called by the customs people and told that we needed to provide them with a breakdown of the recipe of this food product so that they could figure out how much was sugar and apply it against the tariffs and duties of the, of the sugar import taxes and stuff like that. We explained to them that this was going to be sent down to the Catholic Church to be distributed as food for people in Mexico City that were going hungry. We had been there and seen it, and we had made arrangements with the business partner that we were working with. They uh, refused to let it go through. We, we, we told them this is not commercial. We're giving this mm -hmm. to a church so mm -hmm. they can distribute it to the needy people in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. They would not let that go through. What they wanted was our recipe. Mm -hmm. That's what they wanted. Right. And so finally what we wound up doing, after a month of negotiations and after sending three letters, we wound up bringing it home because it had sat so long it was out of date. Wow. And so we brought it back home, and those people never got a chance to get that food. Was this the uh, Mexican officials, or yes. was this the... Um, it was the Mexican officials, customs officials hmm. at Laredo. Hmm. It's, it's absolutely amazing. I finally wound up telling the guy, I said, look, what you're telling me is that you just don't care about the hungry people in Mexico City. Yes. And he he never really challenged that statement. Yeah, you know, he he is the bureaucrat yeah. who is not there to make any decisions. And I have every reason to believe that if I had offered him like three or $400 to get that done, mm -hmm. it would have happened in a heartbeat. Uh -huh. But it, what it tells you, the man totally understood what was going on. Mm -hmm. Well, I would have just, you know, I think I would have sent a letter to the to the church stating that such and such official has refused <laughs> this shipment and um, they might want to check his rosary. <laughs> well, we did, uh, we did contact our business partner down there and, uh -huh. and made sure they understood what had happened. Yeah. They apologized profusely. Yeah. They understood exactly what had happened, mm -hmm. and it was apparent there was nothing they could do about it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's the problem yes. with with the carnal mind. That, that's what happened. It gets so warped. It, they've got that's exactly the the state of mind that Israel came to. It's the state of mind that we're coming to in this country. The other day, I was looking at some advertisement that was sent to me, and um, this particular company wanted to loan me uh, ten thousand dollars. You know, they send you these solicitation mm -hmm. by, by mail, unsolicited, you know. And um, they want 24% per, interest. Wow. Yeah. For what period of time? Um, three years. Whew. That's expensive money. Well, uh, you know, I, as I looked at it, I began to realize what was going on. They were trying to find people who couldn't get credit from anywhere else. They're, tr they're, they're picking on the poor people. Mm -hmm. The poor people don't, do not have access uh, to money. That's why they're poor. They don't have uh, usually good business practices and, and understanding. And so when they can sell their souls 
literally, uh, and hawk their homes or whatever because of, of, of ignorance. Boy, the gotcha mm-hmm. is You'll so... You'll never get out of that you, trap. You, you never get out. It's a spiral to hell mm-hmm. financially. Mm-hmm. And, uh, boy, I just thought to myself, you know, God is, is, it gets very angry when people take advantage of one another. He uh, had rules and regulations for Israel that they weren't even to charge their brethren. That's right. Uh, interest. Interest. Usury. Yeah. The, the, the point that I think is so critical is that when social infrastructure becomes so corrupt, so greedy, so out of control, God says it's not good for man to live with this. There are ways to bring this to an end. And God springs into action. And you notice it's not just the financial <laughs> market where the problem will be either. It'll be in, it'll be in the uh, communications. Yes. It'll be in transportation. Yes. It'll be in whatever energy you've got going. Right. right. Uh, it's in all areas of life. Yeah. It'll be in the food industry. Look at verse 15. He who walks righteously and speaks what is right who rejects gain from extortion and keeps his hand from accepting bribes, he who stops his ears against plots of murder and shuts his eyes against contemplating evil, this is the man who will dwell on the heights, whose refuge will be the mountain fortress. His bread will be supplied and water will not fail him. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty and view a land that stretches afar. Uh, you know, I think, I think that is so neat. These are the kinds of people that can live forever. This brings up a point that we haven't talked about in this series, and I think this is a good place to, to deal with it. In order to live forever with one another and be at peace, there has to be an internal code of ethics that makes this possible. Because, <clears throat> excuse me, if, if, if this code of ethics is not present, eventually distrust, mistrust, uh, eventually anger, hostility, and war are the result. I mean, we have 6,000 years of Earth's history to prove the point. Absolutely. And the newspaper today to prove the point. Yes. What I'm saying is that in order to live for eternity and to be happy and to be joyful, God has established what it takes in order to do that. Many people look at God's way and says, well, that's his call on it. That's just the Almighty shoving his weight around, you know, bullying the rest of us and saying, do it my way. That, that's not the truth. The truth is that God in his infinite wisdom knows exactly what it takes for his creatures having the power of choice to live together in perfect harmony and in loving unity for eternity. And these are the principles that make that possible. Now, if these principles are written in your heart and you love them, you're a good candidate for eternal life. If these principles are not in your heart, if these principles are not in your life, You'll last about 70 years, <laughs> and you've got to go. Yeah. This is what God is constantly trying to show. And um, let's jump down to chapter 34. Come near, you nations, and listen. Pay attention, you peoples. Let the earth hear and all that is in it. 
the world and all that comes out of it. The Lord is angry with all nations. His wrath is upon all their armies. He will totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. Their slain will be thrown out. Their dead bodies will send up a stench. The mountains will be soaked with their blood. All the stars of the heavens will be dissolved and the sky rolled up like a scroll. All the starry host will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. You can see from Isaiah that God has a day of reckoning in which he is going to deal not only with Israel, but with the world, the whole world. Verse 8 the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of retribution to uphold Zion's cause. I've understood this verse to indicate that it would take in the establishment of God's kingdom under plan A about a year for God to bring about the full and final destruction of the wicked, bringing the nations led by Gog and of Magog, you know, and all of them against Jerusalem. I've understood from Isaiah chapter 34 that God's day of vengeance, when he deals with the world, when the stars fall from the sky, the heavens roll back up like a scroll, and the appearing of the Father, the King, and all his beauty, and the Son on his throne, um, I've understood that whole process to take about a year in, in Old Testament, uh, Plan A. Under Plan B, I understand the seven last plagues, they only require 75 days. Things are much more accelerated because there, God is not establishing a kingdom here. He's coming to conduct war and to destroy the wicked and resurrect, you know, the righteous and gather the living righteous up in the air and take them away from here. So under plan B, there's a much shorter uh, process because it doesn't all happen right here. Well, in plan A, it looks like the righteous will have to stay and smell yes. and, and, and look at all the blood and yes. everything. But under plan B... They're you don't have here. to stay. That's right. And, if, and when we get to Ezekiel, uh, you'll find that the Lord said, you know, there'd be enough debris to burn for seven years. <laughs> I'm glad we won't have to, to stay and watch that. That's right. That's right. Okay, let's jump down to chapter 35 and um, verses 3 and 4. Strengthen the feeble hands... Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. This is, again, part of this encouragement that goes back. Do you remember the verses we read um, the other day? about go and hide in your closet, close the door until his wrath is passed by. Mm -hmm. The Lord is coming out of his dwelling to punish the people of the earth for their sins. And um, I, was, I was looking for this verse, and I, don't, I don't, can't put my finger on it right at the moment. But it was the, the idea was that God was going to bring his vengeance and his justice upon the world. And uh, during the seven last plagues, God's people will be hiding, if, as it were, from the um, vengeance of the Lord that is being poured out upon the wicked. One last thing in chapter 35 that I want to pick on here is in verse 8. God is talking about how he's going to make it easy for all those who want to be a part of his kingdom to come from their, um, from the nations. A highway, verse 8, will be there. 
It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will there be, nor will any ferocious beast get up on it. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. You know, several verses prior to that were talking about how the... Um how the bodies of the people will be restored and how the, how the land will be restored. Yes, the lame will leap like a deer. The eyes of the blind will be opened. The burning sand will become a swimming pool. And this highway, this highway, God is going to make travel free, open, easy. No threat of bandits or beasts. You know, there are people who say that salvation <laughs> is it's very, very hard to obtain um, I've always had uh, the opinion that salvation uh, is easy to obtain if you just decide you want it. If when, yes, I mean that's the whole po that's the mystery of it. Mm -hmm. The carnal heart doesn't want to give up nothing. The the Lord is willing to knock down any mountain. Uh, fix a bridge over any river, mm -hmm. whatever it takes for us to get to him if we want to get there. That's right. And and some people get offended whenever you talk about how easy it is to obtain salvation. Uh, for some reason, which I've never figured out, they want it to be hard. Uh, I, I've never figured out why. Why would you want salvation and restoration to be hard to obtain. Well, when I said the carnal heart doesn't want to give up nothing, I, I realize that's improper English, but... Well, obviously you did that on purpose. <laughs> well, I'm trying to make a point. The carnal heart has nothing to offer. <laughs> so the carnal heart doesn't want to give up nothing <laughs> the little nothing it, ha it it hangs on to. It thinks it has. Yes. And the hard part is letting God's will be done and submitting to it and, and letting His rules operate. That's the hard part. The carnal heart is self-seeking. The carnal heart is clamoring always, My will be done. And if I don't get my way, look out world. You know, I'm going to be mad, and I plan to be mad for three weeks. And I intend to make everybody else mad before I, it's I, over I with. I won't be happy unless everybody else is miserable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sounds, like a, sounds like a real child. Here, yes, it? yes. Well, that, that is the carnal heart. <clears throat> we'll move into chapter 36, and um, this... Uh, the story begins to unfold uh, around uh, 705 B.C. In chapter 36, Hezekiah is king of Jer in Jerusalem, and Sennacherib is the king of Assyria. And Sennacherib uh, is going through the land and taking control. And... Um, we get down to verse 4. The field commander for Sennacherib has surrounded the city of Jerusalem. And uh, he says to the king's representatives, You go tell Hezekiah this from me. This is what the great, the great king, the king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing your confidence? You say you have strategy and military strength, but these are only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look now, you are depending on Israel, that splintered reed of a staff, which pierces a man's hand and wounds him if he leans on it. 
such as Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and all who depend on him. And if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar? What he's saying there is that um, if you're depending on the Lord your God and a mere man picked up the altar and the high places and cleaned them all out, what kind of a God is this? It's like um, when Gideon, after his great victory over the Midianites, he went into town and he shoved down the God, the idol of his father. And then the next day, when they found out what Gideon had done, the whole pe all the people in the town wanted to hang him. And uh, the father said, when I said, now think about this for a minute. If Gideon can come in here and push our idol over and break his head off, what kind of a God is this? <laughs> we have a problem here. He can't even take care of his own self. He can't take care of himself. How can he take care of us? And, and that's what the uh, messenger from Sennacherib is saying. In verse 8, he says, now, come on, guys, let's make a bargain. Listen, here's the offer. Come out and fight. I'll give you 2,000 horses if you can find anybody that will ride them. So how can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you are depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, I have come to attack and destroy this land. Have I come to attack and destroy this land without the blessing of the Lord? No, the Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. And that's probably true. Well, get the, no, well, not no, not actually. He's lying through his teeth. But it sure does sound good. Well, it? it's all about destroying their confidence and their faith. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the devil knows what's going on. So the three representatives of King Hezekiah, they said to the uh, uh, field commander, please. Speak to us in Aramaic, since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. Well, that was dumb. Well, yes. Talk about giving away. Yeah. That's so obvious it's unreal. Yeah. But the commander replied, Was it only to your master and to you that my master has sent me to say these things, and not to the men sitting on the wall who, like you, will have to eat their own filth and drink their own urine? See, he's ready... He's going to lay a siege on the He's going to put place. a siege on the city. And so he says, look, guys, you guys sitting up there on the wall, you take care of the king and open the door. It'll go good for you. We've got something for everybody here. Well, Hezekiah is in, is in a stew. What to do? What to do? The uh, field commander called out in Hebrew, as he was leaving, he says, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. Verse 18. Do not let Hezekiah mislead you when he says, The Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered this land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Seraphim? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who are, who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save this land from me? So how do you expect the Lord to deliver Jerusalem from my hand. Well, chapter 37, 1, Hezekiah tears his clothes, puts on sackcloth and ashes. What to do? What to do? Well, now, they were familiar with the effects of a siege. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They knew exactly what, what would happen if that, uh, if that began. Well, 
when King Hezekiah's officials came to him and they gave the report, it just knocked, well, Hezekiah's knees were loosed so that one smote against the other. <laughs> That's an interesting way of saying he was real nervous here. His knees were knocking. And then, while they're sitting there in a stew, trying to figure out what to do, Isaiah. Isaiah comes, you know, striding in to the king, the king's chamber. And he says, tell your master, this is what the Lord says, do not be afraid of what you have heard, those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen. I am going to put a spirit in him so that when he hears a certain report, he will return to his own country, and there I will have him cut down with a sword. So, when the field commander heard that the king of Assyria had left Lachish, he withdrew and found the king fighting against Libna. So, as the story goes on, they finally, uh, the king of Assyria, finally set siege uh, to Jerusalem. He finally gets there, and um, uh, Isaiah is sent again in to uh, see Hezekiah, and he says, Because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word the Lord has spoken against him. And uh, God you know, has several things to say. But over in verse 30, this is kind of an interesting point. This will be a sign for you, O Hezekiah. This year you will eat what grows by itself, and the second year what springs from that. But in the third year sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat their fruit, and once more a remnant of the house of Judah will take root below and bear fruit above. For out of Jerusalem will come a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So, uh, I, I want to speak about Isaiah's comments there, but let me just finish the story. So, because the king of Assyria had insulted the God of heaven, in verse 36, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. And when the people got up the next morning, that is, the people in Jerusalem, there were all the dead bodies when Sennacherib got up and he looked around and he saw 185,000 dead troops, he decided to go home. He returned to Nineveh and one day while he was worshiping in the temple of his God, his sons came in and cut him down with a sword. And uh, Esar Hardin, his son, succeeded him as king. Okay, this is a, a story that King Hezekiah started off as a good man. He tore down the idols. He tore up the, the altars that had been made as places of worship for Baal. And uh, when the enemy comes, Hezekiah is, is helpless. He really and truly is in a helpless situation and the Lord comes and rescues uh, Hezekiah by the hair of his chinny chin chin, as they say. And, uh, Hezekiah, and Isaiah comes in and tells him, look, God's going to give you this sign. This year, you're going to get to eat and continue to harvest the crops from what grows of itself. And the second year of what springs from that. This is the only place in the Bible where we have knowledge of a jubilee cycle, transition time. This is a 49th and a 50th year event. And the language here in Isaiah uh, 37, verse 30, is jubilee language. This is important to know eventually when we study the jubilee calendar because the year is actually 703 B.C. It's a Sabbath year. And 702 B.C. would be the Jubilee year, the Sunday year. And Isaiah is identifying. And see, we know that Sennacherib came to power in Assyria in 705. 
So 705 uh, is would be what? A um, Thursday. A Thursday year. And then so in the Sabbath year of 703, Sennacherib is attacking Jerusalem. And Isaiah comes in and says, this year you will eat what grows by itself. Because they didn't have time to plant. Well, because it's a Sabbath because year rest. See, it's a sabbatical year. But they hadn't been observing those, really. Well. Which is why they were being punished here. Well, that's, that's <clears throat> right. That's right. And God is calling attention back to their need for reformation. Mm -hmm. Isa uh, Hezekiah has started some reformation. And um, uh, he just didn't carry it far enough. But the interesting point here is in Isaiah 37, this little bit of information helps confirm the synchronism of the Jubilee calendar when, when that issue is studied later. God put to death 185,000 soldiers because he had been insulted. I have often thought under plan B that maybe the censor is cast down in response to a great insult that might occur in our world. Whether the insult would come from a United Nations um, event whether the insult might come from a NATO type of an event, I don't know. Or could it come from a religious event? Well, yes. Could it come from a, from a Protestant event? Well, I'm looking for something larger, something more <clears throat> encompassing, representing the global, the global picture. You know how these summits are held, mm -hmm. and all peoples of nations gather, and the leaders and so forth. And I've just wondered, if it might be something to do with a that kind of a event. Yeah. Well, you know, there were all kinds of physical displays whenever God has been insulted in the past, uh, or when anyone has been insulted in the past. There was uh, people tear their clothes, they wear sackcloth, they wear ashes on their heads. Uh, Moses threw the tables of stone down and shattered them. So there are all kinds of things that have occurred when uh, uh, insults uh, were given. So it, it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if the sensor that is supposed to be generating the smoke mm -hmm. that is the prayers of the people, which actually is, is covering up the smell of their sins, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it wouldn't be surprising to note that finally... It just becomes overpowering. There's an emotional response to it, and that that's enough. Uh, yeah, I've just wondered what event it might be that would bring God into immediate and sudden action. That's a scary thought. I've I've been waiting and looking and anticipating that. But I mean, uh, what how, how of what magnitude bigger than look, what we've already seen well, could it be? Look at Belshazzar. He was drinking wine out of the temple uh, goblet, temple temple vessels. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this is a uh, you know Hezekiah was rescued by a miracle. God just came and killed 185,000 enemies. Mm -hmm. That's a miracle uh, uh, of epic proportion. It is outside the realm of normal. That's right. That's right. A few years later, Hezekiah becomes very ill. And when we come back from our intermission, the funny thing about this healing of Hezekiah has is that he now becomes a very proud and arrogant man. How un amazing. Well, it's time to turn the tape over, and we'll continue in just a moment. Welcome back to the second half of our seventh tape on the book of Isaiah. 
This is actually tape number 13 in the 209 series titled Shadows of God. I mention this each time we start either the front uh, end or the second half of the tape just in case people are trying to determine which tape they have in their tape player. <laughs> we are continuing with our study in Isaiah and we're in chapter 38 and um, we are looking at the story of Hezekiah and the marvelous deliverance that uh, God has uh, bestowed upon Hezekiah. I would like uh, to have you go to Second Chronicles uh, chapter 30 um, oh chapter 30 in chapter 30 of Second Chronicles uh, Hezekiah has just become king of Israel. Okay? Now remember, when I say Israel, I'm talking about the, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and he's reigning from Jerusalem. Um, the northern kingdoms are history. Hezekiah is making a tremendous effort to bring Israel... Uh, back from apostasy. He's trying to, to bring his people into a saving relationship with God. And um, look at uh, 2 Chronicles 30, verse 6. At the king's command, couriers were sent throughout Israel and Judah with letters from the king and from his officials which read, People of Israel... Return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may return to you who are left, who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Hezekiah was a smart fellow. He had figured out that God's wrath w was upon the twelve tribes because of apostasy. And he is doing his best to bring Israel into conformity to God's will. So you've got to give the guy an A+, plus, you know, in, the, in that perspective. And he says, Do not be like your fathers and brothers who were unfaithful to the Lord, the God of their fathers, so that he made them an object of horror, as you see. Do not be stiff-necked as your fathers were. Submit to the Lord. And uh, he goes on to say, if you return to the Lord, then your brothers and your children will be shown compassion by their captors and will come back to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He will not turn his face from you if you return to him. So the, the hand of the Lord was upon Hezekiah and blessed him immensely. And uh, as you read here in Second Chronicles, chapters 31 and then 32. You, you know, it's really, Hezekiah puts forward uh, one of the finest Reformation uh, periods in all of Israel's history. And he does a tremendous job. He causes a change of heart and a change of mind. And then uh, here in Second Chronicles 32, um, the king comes down with illness. And um, so in verse 20, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah cried out in prayer to heaven about this. You know, this is when they're being attacked by Sennacherib. And the Lord sent an angel who annihilated all the fighting men and the leaders and officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. That's verse 20 and 21. And uh, here in the book of uh, Second Chronicles, the Bible is sort of following the chronicles of the kings. And so Sennacherib got up that morning and he had to hike home by himself. One day he's in charge of a big army. The next day he's in charge of himself. <laughs> So he withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And then when he went into the temple to worship his God, some of his sons cut him down with a sword. Now, 
After this great display of salvation, the Lord saving Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from Sennacherib, many people brought their offerings to Jerusalem, and they also brought valuable gifts to Hezekiah. From then on, he was highly regarded by all the nations. I mean, when, when your God will swoop down and kill 185,000 men and, and snatch you literally from the jaws of, de, uh, of, of defeat and destruction, there must be something pretty good about you. And notice what the Bible says in verse 24. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death, and he prayed to the Lord who answered him and gave him a miraculous sign. But Hezekiah's heart was proud, and he did not respond to the kindness shown him. Therefore, the Lord's wrath was on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah repented of the pride of his heart, as did the people of Jerusalem. Therefore, the Lord's wrath did not come upon them during the days of Hezekiah. This is a part of Hezekiah's story that doesn't often get told. After Hezekiah was honored by God, and that honor I'm, I'm describing as when God killed 185,000. Everybody thought Hezekiah was, I mean, he was connected to God. <laughs> he had a direct line to the creator of the universe. And Hezekiah became highly exalted uh, among all the nations. Um, because, you see, Assyria was threatening everybody. And when Hezekiah's God had just wiped out the big threat, uh, all of a sudden, Hezekiah was a divine king. And remember, <clears throat> this man had boasted about the gods of all the other nations that he had conquered. Yes. And that the Lord had sent him to take this city. Okay. You that's, put all yeah, of that yeah. together. That's right. That's right. Well, now back to Isaiah chapter 38. Hezekiah uh, has been told to put his house in order. You see that in verse 1. Because you are going to die, you will not recover. So Isaiah... The same guy here, Isaiah, who told him that uh, God was going to deal with Sennacherib and not to worry about, you know, the threat of Sennacherib, king of Assyria. Isaiah is the same guy that comes into the king's chamber and says, King, O oh king, you're going to die. It's probably going to happen. Put your, no, put your <laughs> house in order because you happen. will not recover. This is on one occasion when the prophet didn't say, O king, live forever. Yeah. <laughs> Long live the king. Yeah. He didn't say that. <laughs> he came in, uh, storming into the palace, and he said, Put your house in order, king. This is it. You're dead. Yeah, and looking at it from Hezekiah's point of view, hmm, this is probably going to happen here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Hezekiah then in verse 2, this, this verse cracks me up. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and kicked his feet, <laughs> had a little temper and had right. a little tantrum and he prayed to the Lord and he said look Lord don't you remember how I walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes and Hezekiah just wept and wept and wept now could could there be another way to read that okay could it be that Hezekiah turned his face to the wall accepting his fate and just said remember oh lord how i walked you know look like remember me after i'm dead because nobody else is going to uh and then he wept because he knew he was going to die and he didn't want to die just yet okay i, I can understand your, your point there what isaiah doesn't tell you though is that the reason that hezekiah wasn't going to recover and, and why God, through Isaiah, had put this sentence upon him was because Hezekiah had gotten too big for his britches. That's what I was trying to show mm -hmm. from Second yeah. Chronicles 32. Right. He, he had become so arrogant, he had become useless. 
you know, the world's smallest package is a man wrapped up in himself. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, uh, the whole point, you, you have to take everything in context. Yes, yes. You can't just pull one verse out and, and read it a certain way without figuring out what is going on all the way around. There usually is more to the picture than is stated mm -hmm. in any one text, and that's why we are so grateful to have Second Chronicles mm -hmm. to give us the Paul Harvey, right. the rest of the story. Well, the, the reason I, I gave you that other mm -hmm. scenario is to illustrate the fact that if you just read one sentence, mm -hmm. you can get the wrong Interpretation sure, out of it. Sure. And uh, so, A, Isaiah was sent in by the Lord to give the king the message, you will not recover. Isaiah uh, then leaves the chamber. The king turns over in his bed, and, and, and really, he has a come to Jesus meeting. <laughs> uh, I got to tell you about that. Um, uh, some time ago, my mom, her car, uh, blew a head gasket. And um, they took it down to the Ford place to have it checked out. And uh, the mechanic who was assigned to do the diagnostics and the full workup on the, what the problem was did not do his job very well. So he made a recommendation and they repaired um, something that had nothing really to do with her, with the real problem. <laughs> it sounds very familiar. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, two days later, you know, the car is still, it's getting worse and running hot and, and just, uh, you know, malfunctioning so that it can't even hardly run. And they carry it back to the Ford place. And this time the service manager, he gets the guy who, uh, was responsible for the diagnostics and for the workup, and um, they go over the problem very carefully, and they discover that that this is a problem that the mechanic should have quickly detected following standing operational procedures. So when he called mom to tell her what the problem was, and it was going to cost a thousand dollars to repair. He said, I want to assure you that we had a come-to-Jesus meeting with the mechanic. <laughs> and she wanted to know what that meant. And he said, well, that's where you come in and you confess all your sins. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that mechanic came in and confessed his sins. Yeah. But I bet your mother, your mother still paid the bill. When it oh, was yes. All said and yes. Done. They did give her credit for the first $200 she had already <laughs> spent in vain. Mm -hmm. And I guess they, well, took that out of, that. they took that out of, her, out of his pocket, the mechanic. <laughs> I don't know. But I, I kind of chuckled about the come to Jesus meeting, mm -hmm. you know, where you confess all your sins. Now that's a, that, that's a standard uh, uh, little phrase used in the commodities market, too. When, I see. Uh, when uh, uh, someone who's supposed to deliver flour or soybean oil or something like that, and and the train car doesn't get there, or the or the truck doesn't get there on time, uh, some some somebody will have a come to Jesus meeting about this and, uh, and confess their <laughs> sin, right? <laughs> well, Hezekiah had a come to Jesus meeting. Mm -hmm. He's in his bed dying, and he is. He, he's just, he is repentant. And the Lord, um, in verse 4, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Go and tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. In other words, your repentance. I will add 15 years to your life. And I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. And this is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he's promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the ten steps it has gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So the sunlight went back the ten steps it had gone down. Now, actually moved the earth. 
Or move the sun or move Well, yes, I've maybe. heard people say that, and I don't, I don't believe that. You just moved a shadow. Yeah. God can move a shadow without having to disrupt the whole momentum and equilibrium of the universe. I mean, I mean, it's like it's it's like this. I mean, when you go to sweep your garage out, I mean, I know you do that sometimes. Once in a while. Uh, do you do you move the garage back and forth, or do you move the broom back and forth? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> The way my back hurts, I'm not sure what I've moved. Well, my point is, is that God can move the shadow. That's not a problem for him. And so God has given Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, incidentally, becomes one of the few people to live upon the face of the earth who knows how many days he has left to live each day. Fourteen years, three months. Thirteen years, eight months. One year, two days, three weeks. Mm. Two more days. Two more days. This explains, incidentally, why his son Manasseh, who was a no good king, a vile, a vile king, he puts Manasseh on the throne, and Manasseh and Hezekiah co reign when Manasseh turns 12. Manasseh, I believe, is on the throne almost 55 years, if I remember correctly. So um, Hezekiah writes a little poetry after he's been healed. In the prime of my life must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years. I said, I will not again see the Lord, the Lord in the land of the living no longer will I look upon mankind or be with those who now dwell in this world. Like a shepherd's tent, my house has been pulled down and taken from me. Like a weaver, I have rolled up my life, and he has cut me off from the loom. Day and night, you made an end of me. It's really quite a, a touching bit of poetry. And, you know, and at the end, the Lord will save me. And we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. Now look at, look at verse 15. I will walk humbly all my years because of this anguish of my soul. Yes. Hezekiah really had, had a, a change of heart. Now, I want to you know, you know what happens next. In chapter 39... When Hezekiah has uh, recovered, the king of Babylon um, sent Hezekiah some letters and a gift because he had heard of his miraculous illness, I mean his miraculous recovery from his death, death bed um, recovery. And um, when Hezekiah received the envoys from Babylon, what did he do? He did the most stupid thing a king could do. He showed him all of his riches and all of his treasures. This says something about humility. And see if, if what I'm about to say will make sense to you. Humility starts with an attitude. A man who has... $100,000 in the bank has a very different attitude on life than a man with $10 in the bank. Yes or no? Right. What's the big difference? Confidence. Confidence, okay. Mm -hmm. What else? Well, I don't know. There are several other things that I could say, but I'm not sure where you're headed. So. Well, <laughs> the point I'm making is that the man with $100,000 in the bank, he doesn't need others. He's not in a dependent situation. He, he's in an independent. He has an attitude uh, and, a, and a practice, a, a lifestyle that makes him, uh, that puts him on the flip side of a man who is desperate for life and to make ends meet and to survive. Correct. Uh, the man with all the money in the bank has 
a broader vista of options. Yes. Of things that he can do with his time, yes. with his money, with yes. his... Uh, Pleasure. Yeah. I, yeah. Mean, I mean, life is in... He's in control of life. Of, of, of the options that are in life. That's yeah. correct. Whereas the man who has $10 in the bank is at the mercy of fate. Of whatever happens. Whatever's coming at him, he's got to deal with it, and it's hard. And interestingly enough, the guy with no money will spend more time thinking about money than the guy... Who has well, a bank full of money? Well, the guy who's who's got a pocket full of money is con- he's not he's got the money. Yeah. So why worry? So he, he's he's, he's con- thinking about his family. He's thinking about fun. He's thinking yes. about a little bit of this, that, and the other. Yes. The house. Yeah. The guy with no money, on the other hand, he's thinking, how am I going to pay the bill? How am I going to? Where's food coming right. from? Right. How am I going to survive? Where do the clothes come from? What if one of us gets sick now? Right. What, what are we going to do here? Right, right. So pain and worry and anguish and, and right. concern over money. They're very two different lifestyles. Yes, they are. Very different. Very. Which one do you think God wants us to live? Well, that's the point I'm going to. When a man who has all the money becomes a humble man, you need to understand that he does not immediately wake up in the same point in the same reference of behavior and thinking that the poor fellow has in other words after you've been well financially off for many years you've acquired a certain pattern of doing business and doing things and a and a confidence and an attitude that has just all become your being mm-hmm. when hezekiah became a humbled man he did not revert to the guy who had been struggling so that when the envo- the envoys from babylon showed up hezekiah's basic reaction as the king who is divinely spared life, the king with whom his God has killed 185,000 Assyrians. You know, the Babylonians hated the Assyrians, and they never had been able to kill that many. And yet Hezekiah's God could do it. I mean, here's a man who, who has been deified by many in his nation as the, you know, uh, next to God himself. And so when they show up, Hezekiah loses his humility and begins to revert to his old way. Well, he he believes their compliments. I mean, let's face it, these guys are going to come in here uh, and they're going to be very solicitous toward this man. They're going to be very kind, very generous. Yes. And, yes. and and after yes. about 10 minutes of this, he's going yes. to start believing it. Well, the, the end result, though, the end result is that Hezekiah ends up showing his wealth as proof of God's blessings. And he should have been showing them his health as God's blessing as instead of his wealth. That's correct. That's correct. And, and basically all he wound up doing was putting an idea in their head to take back to the king. That's right. Here is a pot of gold. And all we've got to do is swoop down and take it. Now we may have to wait for this guy to die because I'm not sure I want to attack him. But yeah, we may yeah. have to wait for him to die. But yeah. after he's gone... yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's and so you know that's that's exactly what happened, and and notice what what Isaiah you know, I'm sure the king really had ambivalent feelings about Isaiah. <laughs> Isaiah pops up and says, you know, o king live forever. God's going to destroy the Assyrians. The next time he sees him, Isaiah says, King, you're not going to recover from this. The next time he sees him, Isaiah says, well, God's going to give, give you 15 years of life. And then here in verse 5 of chapter 39, 
Isaiah pops in to the king and he says, what did they see in your palace? Oh, they saw everything, Hezekiah said. There is nothing that I didn't show them. Then Isaiah said, hear the word of the Lord, the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, Hezekiah, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And get the response now of Hezekiah. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought at least there will be peace and security in my lifetime. Peace and safety, huh? Yeah. All this king was worried about was his own self. His own watch. Yes. I don't care what happens to the nation. I don't care what happens after that, but I've got 15 good years. And after I'm dead, I don't care. That's right. Mm. You see the problem. Yeah. It's interesting. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and everything that your fathers have stored up until this day. In other words, he, he had a lot of heirlooms there. Oh, yes. That, that, that were oh, passed yes. down from who knows yes. how, how far. Yes, yes, yes. It's all going to be gone. It's all going to be taken away. Well, the story, my take on this whole story is, is this. Hezekiah was a good man in several ways. Hezekiah was a bad man in several ways. God appreciated the good in Hezekiah because he did tear down the altars of Baal and bring about restoration to Israel to some level. But Hezekiah dropped out of the school of sanctification. That's the real problem here. Hezekiah reached a level of religious commitment that satisfied himself, and he quit. He just plateaued out. Yes. He, unlike King David, David never plateaued. Now, David made some really stupid mistakes, but to his very end, David loved the, the Lord with all his heart, mind, and soul. Hezekiah shows how selfish he really did become, only concerned about his own good, his own well-being, and so forth and so on. And uh, he puts his son Manasseh on the throne. Manasseh is a spoiled brat, and Manasseh uh, leads the people into the grossest of sins. So it, the slippery slope of sin finally it just takes over Israel. With chapter 40 of Isaiah, we move into more poetry. Um, here we're going to pick up a, a number of prophetic statements and prophetic utterances that will apply um, to the children of Israel in days to come. And uh, there's a few selected verses that I would like to um, identify in, in these last few minutes of today's tape. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Uh, this is some poetry that would be used by the God's people from Babylonian captivity. This is where they're going. This is where we've just, you know... Uh, Isaiah has just told Hezekiah, everything you've got here is going to Babylon. And uh, so this is intended as poetry that would be encouragement and promise to those who would go into exile. Isn't it interesting that <clears throat> she has paid for her yes. sins? She has uh, received double for all her sins. Just like in Revelation 18. Uh, come out of Babylon, you remember the message there, that you be not partakers of her sins, for God has remembered her iniquities and has paid her back double. You know, 
Again, same parallel language. Um, here in uh, verse 3, a voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Where do you hear that language in the New Testament? This is John the Baptist. When they, when they, when they ask him, well, who are you? He says, I am the voice of one crying in the desert. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight the way of the Lord. Isn't this the passage that's in the, um, the uh, musical composition, The Messiah? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. thought it was. Mm-hmm. Um, then, you, you know, each one of these little verses has a little snapshot of things under plan A that were put to songs that the children of Israel could sing and take hope and courage. Um, verse 5, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all mankind together will see it. It's, it's a little couplet, if you will, a little uh, poetic statement that is actually a prophecy. Right. And, and this compares with what we know in Revelation, you know, chapter 1, verse 10, when Jesus comes, behold, every eye shall see him. And it's designed in such a way that it's easy to remember. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, verse 10. Behold, the sovereign Lord comes with power. And his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. We see the same thing in Revelation 22. He says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Plan A, plan B. Verse 17, Before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. Isaiah forty seventeen, Under plan B, when he strikes down the nations, that means they're worthless. They're worthless. Verse 23, he brings princes to naught and reduces the, the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither like a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. And the timing is about the same for the ten rulers that Satan will appoint in the end time. Yes, yes. Just about the time they take root, mm -hmm. the word of his mouth yeah. blows them away. Blows them away. Verse 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He will not grow tired or weary. And his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. These little poetic statements, these little prophetic statements... God designed as memory verses to strengthen his people, to strengthen those who loved him in times to come. And as you look into the New Testament, you will discover that the various New Testament writers will quote Isaiah. Some of these little statements are so vivid and so applicable in that setting, and boom, they make the statement, and it, it is like, Words of gold and frames of silver. Um, look at verse uh, chapter 41. Verse, um, well, let's start with uh, verse 1. Be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. Uh, this is a parallel under plan A with Revelation 20, the great white throne judgment where all the nations come before God. Remember, the wicked are all resurrected. Satan leads them up, and then God stops them right before they take on the holy city. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? His hand subdues nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword 
to wind-blown chaff with his bow. He pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path his feet have not traveled before. Who has done this and carried it through, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am He. I am Alpha and Omega. Same plan A, plan B. Um, look down at uh, 41.8. But you, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners, I called you, I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will, will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is, is giving this counsel and this encouragement because his people usually do not understand his ways. But they can hang on to certain promises that are clearly stated, even though they don't comprehend the big picture. Even though we can't understand all that he's accomplishing, these statements are given to us so that we can have confidence when we can't understand or see why God is doing things this way. Look here at um, um, 21. Present your case, says the Lord. Set forth your arguments, says Jacob's king. Bring in your idols to tell us what is going to happen. Tell us what the former things were so that we may consider them and know their final outcome. Or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds so that we may know that you are gods. Do something, good or bad, so that we will be dismayed and filled with fear. God says, listen, but you are less than nothing and your works are utterly worthless. He who chooses you is detestable. Here God is saying, I am the God of Israel, and yet all of you people insist on worshiping these stupid idols. In the last um, four minutes, look at Isaiah 42, verse 6. God speaks to his people, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. To open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place. And new things I declare before they spring into being, I announce them to you. God is showing in these chapters that we may not understand his ways. We may not under understand everything he's doing. We may not understand at the current time why things are the way they are. And this is especially true when you're suffering. But God says, Trust in me. I know what I'm doing. My plans reach beyond one generation. My plans reach beyond one lifetime. My plans reach beyond the, the, the finite. You have to trust me. You have to have confidence in me. You have to choose to put faith in me. And here's my history. Look at my history of what I've done. Am I not worthy of faith? Am I not worthy of your confidence? Am I not worthy of, of your love and respect based on what I've done alone? Verse 21, Isaiah 42. It pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteous to make his law great and glorious. It pleased the Lord to give an understanding of what it takes to live with fellow creatures 
throughout eternity. It pleased the Lord to reveal how it's done. Look what he says here in verse 24. Who handed Jacob over to become loot and Israel to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned? For they would not follow his ways. They did not obey his law. So he poured out on them his burning anger, the violence of war. It enveloped them in flames, yet they did not understand. It consumed them, but they did not take it to heart. Well, David, we have here in the last minute, a, you know, to summarize, we're, we're still in the middle of this poetic uh, expression, and this will continue on down to the last chapters of Isaiah. But I just want to close today's um, study with two points. First, in each of these little couplets, in each of these little poetic, prophetic statements, we, we, we learn something about God that is worth remembering. In this last statement here, they would not follow my laws. They would not respect me. They would not love me. So I poured on them in burning anger the violence of war. Does that say something about all wars? I think so. Does that say something about God's overall administration of earth? I think so. I believe that if we can rise above and, and apply this corporately and, and the ways of God to the world in general, our appreciation for the book of Isaiah will be profound. Well, that's all the time we have for today for. I want to thank you for being here. Glad to be here. It's always a joy to open up God's Word and study. Well, we will continue our study opening up with chapter 43 in our next tape. Our next tape. Our next tape. Our next tape.